So, yep. okay. Good evening, everyone. I'd like to call the meeting to order. City of Moorhead City Council meeting is approximately 5.30 p.m. If we can all please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you, everyone, and we'll address it. Are there any agenda amendments at this time? Seeing none, then. Uh, there we go. You okay? Yep, actually, Ms. Mayor, um, I just wanted to make sure on agenda number 5A, I think, I'm not sure what page it is. Um, should it read 2018 versus 2019? Council member uh, Carlson? Uh, I believe it is on page. It's agenda item number 5A. Um, under financial considerations. Oh, there's a typo. You're saying under financial considerations, it says it was approved on December 10th, 20, 2019, and you mean it should it be 2018. 2018? That's correct. Okay, and then also on page 39, agenda number 12A, I believe it's the same typo. It should be City Council Action 1210 of 2018 versus 2019. Uh, what page in your packet? Council Member Carlson. 39. I think those are just clerical and we'll just fix them online. Yes, that's correct. Thank you. Thank you. We'll make said noted uh, corrections. <clears throat> Any other amendments? Seeing none, we'll move on to the consent agenda. Uh, nothing has been received regarding taking anything off consent. Is there a motion? I'm sorry. Uh, motion, motion moved by Council Member Durand, second by Council Member Watson Curry. All in favor, please say, please state by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Uh, recognitions and presentations. And we'll welcome uh, our members from uh, Flaherty and Hood and Frederick and Byron for the 2019 Minnesota Legislative Overview. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor and members of the council. Uh, my name is Bradley Peterson. I'm a shareholder with the firm of Flaherty and Hood in St. Paul. And we were asked uh, to come up uh, today and give you a little bit of overview um, and introduction to our two firms and the lobbying services that we provide uh, on Moorhead's behalf in St. Paul. Um, and I will also talk a little bit in my presentation about uh, the city of Moorhead's relationship with the Coalition of Greater Minnesota Cities. Uh, and so with that, I will uh, dive right in. Uh, so about uh, Flaherty and Hood, uh, the firm was founded in the early 1990s um, uh, specifically to serve uh, local governments in rural Minnesota. That's really been our key focus for many, many years. Uh, we do some other things, but really the uh, primary uh, business that we're in is serving local governments such as Moorhead uh, at the Capitol. We bo do both uh, legal work and lobbying work. Our firm is split uh, about half and half, uh, and we currently have 22 staff members. So our relationship uh, with the city of Moorhead, almost since the beginning, um, our firm has had a relationship with the city of Moorhead, um, doing both uh, lobbying and uh, some special project legal work. Uh, on the lobbying side, which I'm here to talk about, uh, we've done work related to the Border Cities Program, the Disparity Reduction Credit, um, and then also some work over the years in housing, economic development, uh, bonding and environmental and regulatory issues. So we have a long history uh, representing Moorhead at the Capitol. Um, at the Capitol, it's myself and my associate, Shane Zart, who does most of the work uh, on behalf of Moorhead. So 
uh, our most recent work um, is related to um, some items in the tax bill. And as you'll hear from my colleagues at Fredrickson and Byron, uh, we sort of split uh, the portfolio a little bit. Um, Flaherty and Hood tends to do most of the tax-related work, which is where the Border Cities program falls in. Um, and they've been doing uh, some bonding and some other uh, work as well. And they'll talk more about that. On the tax side, uh, in 2017, we were successful in passing an additional appropriation to the Border Cities program of $3 million. Uh, this program is, of course, split amongst the uh, five border cities. Uh, we did work to fix a TIF issue that Moorhead had, had uh, in the most uh, recent tax bill. Uh, in 2018, we worked on a technical correction to some Border Cities language, uh, which was in the vetoed uh, tax bill and will need to be uh, looked at again this year, um, as well as some uh, done some research on enhancements to the Border City program over the years. Um, and this year, our primary activity will be working to uh, get an ongoing appropriation to the Border Cities program so that we don't have to keep going back to the legislature every so often and making the ask. Uh, that way, you're just embedded in the uh, state budget and uh, becomes part of the forecast, and it's an ongoing appropriation, which will be best for, for everyone. Um, that's the primary work that we've done for the city of Moorhead specifically recently. Um, the next item that I'll discuss is the relationship that Moorhead has with the Coalition of Greater Minnesota Cities. Um, for your, oops, just got ahead of myself there. Uh, the Coalition of Greater Minnesota Cities currently is 97 cities across the state, um, outside of the seven county metro area. Uh, we work primarily in five issue areas, local government aid, economic development, annexation and land use, transportation, and environmental uh, regulation and funding. Um, specifically on these issues from a proactive nature from a Greater Minnesota perspective. Um, the city of Moorhead um, has been one of our anchor members. You're one of our largest members and have been members uh, for a long, long time. Uh, many city officials in the city of Moorhead have served leadership roles uh, with the coalition, uh, president, board, other things. Uh, currently, uh, the city of Moorhead actually acts as treasurer for the CGMC, um, and Chris Volkers is uh, acting in that capacity and sits on the on the board as well. Um, so we appreciate her good counsel and the strong role that the city of Moorhead has played in a lot of our programs over the years. One thing, especially if you are new uh, to the council, uh, that you may be uh, wondering about is what is the relationship between the Coalition of Greater Minnesota Cities and the League of Minnesota Cities? Of course, the city of Moorhead, um, as just about every city uh, in Minnesota, is a member of the League. Um, but the CGMC works exclusively for Greater Minnesota because there are some issues that, because of the League's broad constituency, large cities, small cities, rural cities, suburban cities, uh, the two core cities of Minneapolis and St. Paul, they just can't get involved in uh, weighing in on one side or another. So for instance, if you think about the local government aid formula, uh, they can argue generally for uh, additions to the money in the program, but it's CGMC that's sitting there at the table uh, making sure that there's a fair distribution for rural cities like Moorhead. And the, the best way to think about it is, and the analogy that I've taken to using is as a teeter-totter. You've got the League of Cities as kind of the base. On one end of the board, you've got Minneapolis-St. Paul and the metro cities and their lobbyists sitting on the other end. And sitting on the other end of the board is the CGMC balancing it out for rural Minnesota. And so we're really that counterbalance to uh, other forces at the legislature. Oftentimes, though, we find ourselves working hand in hand with those other constituencies as well as uh, the League. A um, little bit about our priorities for 2018. Um, we're looking to get an increase of uh, $30.5 million to the LGA appropriation. Uh, this would get it back to the amount of money that was paid out in 2002, not inflation adjusted, just the check that the wrote, state wrote to cities uh, across, the, across the spectrum. We're looking at uh, advocating for $128 million for clean water grant loan programs uh, to help with the uh, refurbishment and construction of various uh, wastewater treatment facilities and water facilities across the state, city street funding, and then for many of our members, child care has become an increasingly uh, difficult issue um, that has been holding back economic development in their communities. So we're starting to do some work on that, uh, that front as well. This by no means an exhaustive list, just kind of some of the highlights. One thing I want to mention uh, in terms of local government aid, and all of this is, of course, in your packet. This is just a little teaser, appetizer, as it were, to some of our policy. Um, here's the... Um, 
uh, history of appropriations since 2002 uh, that Moorhead has gotten in terms of local government aid. And you see it's, it's relatively flat over the years. You can see the dip in the early years of the Plenty administration when there was unallotments, um, a bump up, a little bump down, and then kind of flat. Um, we are looking at um, doing some things in the formula um, that would help cities like Moorhead because you guys are essentially at your ceiling in terms of how much LGA you get. And so we've already had discussions with members of the legislature about um, some formula adjustments that we might uh, be able to make that would provide, as we put more money into the LGA formula, that Moorhead would continue to increase um, and help uh, provide services and, and keep property taxes at a reasonable level. So you can see from our proposal here, the charts. Uh, right now, uh, Moorhead's getting about $7.18 million in LGA. Um, if current law were to prevail, no change in the appropriation, no change in the formula, you'd get about an additional $4,000 um, just because of how the, the, the natural shifting within the formula. However, with our proposal, $30.5 million increase and some formula adjustments, um, you'd go up uh, a couple of hundred thousand dollars there um, on your LGA. So that's what we're targeting. That's what we're working on. Of course, between now and the end of the legislative session in May, there's a, a long, long way to go. And we're going to need your help in able to achieve some of these uh, goals. And so in conclusion, I know many of you are coming to our Legislative Action Day on January 30th uh, in St. Paul. We come down, lobby the legislators, get briefed on the issues, um, mingle with other city officials. Our summer conference this year is in Bemidji, uh, July 24th to the 26th. Um, and we are um, available for your uh, viewing on social media at Greater Minnesota Cities and through Facebook and our website as well. So that's kind of the brief, quick hit on uh, what Flaherty and Hood does both for the city individually and through the Coalition of Greater Minnesota Cities. And with that, I'd like to bring up my colleagues from Fredrickson and Byron. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, thanks uh, for having here, us here tonight. Um, I'm here with Andy Pomeroy, also with Fredrickson and Byron. Uh, Fredrickson and Byron is a Minneapolis-based law firm, uh, started in 1948 with about 270 plus uh, attorneys in it, uh, but we have offices in greater, well, we have offices in Des Moines, Fargo, Bismarck, uh, so we, we are a regional law firm. Um, I'm the chair of the government relations practice, and we've had the government relations practice there since 2006. Um, I am originally from Moorhead, so I have some ties back to the community. Uh, left here about 15 years ago to pursue other interests and ended up uh, being a lobbyist now for the city of Moorhead now for about 10 years. Um, one of the things that I want to emphasize is the fact that, that um, over the years, about 10 years ago when we were, were brought on, uh, Moorhead made a strategic decision to, to have two, two lobby groups working together on the issues. And originally we would split up the issues. We would do the work on all the issues together, but we, we figured out the last few years that it worked better just to divide those issues up. Um, where Flaherty and Hood um, would focus on tax-related issues. Uh, we've been focusing more on the bonding side and the building code side as we've gone on. Uh, with that, I'd like to turn it over to Andy um, and just say a few words about what, what our recent efforts have been. So, yeah. And Mr. Pomeroy, before you uh, start, just as an FYI, uh, we do have a public uh, hearing that we'll have to have at 545. So I wanted to give you the heads up just in case I have to cut you off. Sure. Sorry. Yeah. So, Mr. Mayor, Council Members, uh, as Kevin mentioned, Andy Pomeroy, also with Fredrickson and Byron. <clears throat> uh, been with the firm about four years, uh, coming from the legislative staff prior to that. Um, and as Kevin mentioned, I'd take a lead for the city on some of the bonding issues. We've had a lot of success on the 2021 grade separation, on some additional flood hazard mitigation dollars. Um, we're continuing to work on uh, you know, other bonding projects that the city's prioritized this year, the transfer station with the county, uh, the 11th Street grade separation, additional flood money. Um, those sort of things. Also working on some, some building code issues to make uh, Moorhead a little more competitive with our friends across the river. Um, and with that, maybe I'll stop there and let you uh, get on to the next part of the agenda. Does anyone have any questions, comments? Thank you. 
Sorry, now nobody heard that. But I wanted to publicly <laughs> thank them for their good work on the behalf of the city of Moorhead. Thank you. I've had the opportunity to meet, <clears throat> uh, I can say, counsel uh, from both law firms. And uh, on, on behalf of the council and the city, we thank you for your efforts uh, to make our city competitive economically. And thank you for all of your hard work. Appreciate it. Mr. Mayor, we've enjoyed doing it. We, we look forward to working with you um, into the future. So thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. So we can move on to our public hearing, uh, which, oh, thank you. I wish I had to start that right away. Uh, is there a motion to approve uh, the minutes, if we had a chance to review the minutes? I'm sorry, can we do roll call first, beginning of the agenda? Sorry, we okay. skipped right over that. Um, number one on the agenda, the roll call, if we can have the city clerk do it, that'd be great. No worries. Shelley Dahlquist? Here. Sarah Watson-Curry? Here. Shelley Carlson? Here. Heidi Durand? Here. Joel Paulson? Here. Steve Gertz? Here. Chuck Hendrickson? Here. Mayor Judd? Here. Motion made by Council Member Durand and seconded by Council Member Paulson. All in favor of approving the minutes, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Public hearing. And my understanding, trying to get to my point here. This is for the Community Development Block Grant 2019 Action Plan. Mr. Mayor, I think you have a little cheat sheet, sorry, in your drawer that you need to read, I think, for the public hearing. Do you see that? John, do you know what he's supposed to read to open the public hearing? Yeah, I don't know it off the top of my head. <clears throat> Is there a motion to open the public hearing? So the motion has been moved by Council Member Duran and seconded by Council Member Bots. Oh, I'm sorry, Council Member Carlson. And can we get a vote on motion? I'll signify by saying aye. Aye. <laughs> All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Public meeting is now open. Good evening. Uh, my name is Joshua Huffman. I am the Community Development Program Administrator for the city. I want to thank you all for uh, taking the time this evening to hold this public hearing uh, for the 2019 Community Development Block Grant Action Plan. Uh, a couple of notes, no action is needed tonight. Uh, final council consideration is scheduled for the 28th of January. Uh, we are currently in a 30-day public comment period that ends on January 26th. Uh, no comments have been received to date, although prior to this meeting I was informed that there's one coming soon. Uh, and there was a public meeting prior to plan development on November 14th in which no one attended. Uh, in your packet, you have a chart of activities proposed for 2019. Uh, most of these are similar to past years. They're all consistent with our uh, five-year consolidated plan. Uh, as I go through and summarize the activities, uh, since community development block grant is kind of a mouthful, I'm going to just refer to it by its acronym CDBG. So I'll start with capital improvements to public rental housing. Uh, Moorhead Public Housing's Sharpview Apartments needs elevator upgrades, which are critical for its users. Uh, improvements will preserve building property uh, and enhance livability for residents, uh, staff, and visitors. Funds, funds are contingent on additional grant funding from other sources. If those aren't awarded, CBD, CDBG funds will be used to do an additional home rehabilitation loan. Uh, the local match gives uh, MPHA significant leverage points, which makes its grant application more competitive. Uh, the proposed budget for this activity is $43,000, including administration. Uh, the next project uh, is one of the city's longest running programs. It is the Home Rehabilitation Loan Program. These are no interest loans that are repayable on sale. Loans range from $20,000 to $25,000. Uh, they are given on a first come first serve basis. Typically there's a wait list of six to 12 months. Uh, income limits apply. 
We are proposing nine to ten projects plus emergency repairs for 2019. Uh, I would also like to note that not only has this program contributed to much needed improvements in Moorhead, uh, in Moorhead homes, but also has doubled the CDBG line of credit uh, as a result of loan repayments this year. Uh, the proposed budget for this activity is $248,500, uh, including administration. Next project is acquisition for accessible rental housing construction. Creative Care for Reaching Independence, or CCRI, will construct an affordable rental unit assisting disabled persons whose income falls below 80% of median income. CDBG funds will be used to acquire a lot uh, that they will use to construct the unit. This will be provided on a deferred loan basis to CCRI, which accrues no interest and will be repaid upon the sale. Proposed budget for this activity is $40,500, including administration. Next, we have acquisition for affordable housing construction. Habitat for Humanity will construct an affordable housing unit for home ownership for a family whose income falls below 80% of median income. CDBG funds will be used towards paying down special assessments on a lot that will be used for construction of the unit. This will be provided on a deferred loan basis uh, to the family selected by Habitat. The proposed budget for this is $25,500, including administration. Next, accessibility improvements through Freedom Resource Center. This program constructs ramps uh, and makes other home accessibility improvements. Income limits apply like the rehab loans. Uh, it is grant-based though, so it is not repaid. The proposed budget for this activity is $2,200, including administration. After school programming at Romke Park is delivered by Moorhead Parks and Recreation. Uh, this program keeps kids, kids engaged and active, as well as offers snacks and home ownership help, or sorry, homework help uh, for the after school program. Students are typically uh, under 12 years old. Uh, income limits apply. At least 51% of the participants have to come from households with income below 80% of the area median income. Proposed budget for this activity is $6,200, including administration. Next activity is Play Outside Daily, uh, Mobile Recreation for Youth. It is delivered by the Boys and Girls Club of the Red River Valley. This program offers portable recreation opportunities in Queens, Belsley, and Stone Mill Parks uh, by means of their Play Outside Daily truck, which is staffed by recreation leaders and filled with play equipment. Uh, income limits apply on this as well, and the budget for this activity proposed is $5,200, including administration. Opportunities under trend under transit, delivered by Metro Area Transit. Uh, this program provides discounted bus passes to extremely low income individuals who are seeking or going to work or attending workforce training. Uh, income limits apply, they must be 30% of the area median income or less. So for a single individual, that's $17,400 or less. Uh, the goal is 20 participants each year and it's primarily uh, for those that are homeless. Uh, the proposed budget for this activity is $4,200, including administration. Homebuyer Education, uh, offered by Lakes and Prairies Community Action Partnership. Uh, the core principles of this program include home affordability, mortgage qualification, uh, incentives, maintenance, and homeowner responsibilities. Uh, income limits apply with that as well, and uh, the proposed budget for the activity is $10,200, uh, which will come from remaining 2018 CDBG funds, uh, and that does include administration as well. And the last uh, item is program administration, uh, which includes program delivery, reporting, monitoring, uh, and the Human Rights Commission as well. The proposed budget for administration is $92,770. $777, uh, program administration and public service caps uh, have caps or limits that are based on grant award amount and program income. Uh, overall, the estimated budget is $513,889. Any significant fluctuations from this estimation uh, will be addressed in a plan amendment which would come before the council. That summarizes the items uh, covered in the public hearing and I'd like to open it for questions and comment. Thank you. Council Member Duran. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you for that um, recap or the, the, the plan. I had a question real quick about the, the project with CCRI. I didn't quite catch um, if that would be a single family home or will that be a group home or, or 
Can you explain? Yeah, absolutely. Just a, and sorry, I should have included more. that. Um, it'll be a single family home, okay. uh, but their intent is uh, to house four disabled individuals. Okay, okay. They so meet the income guidelines. So four individuals, they each have to meet yes, the income? Yes, they each have to be below 80% of the area median income. Okay, and then 18 years or older, or is there a different age limit? Um, I suppose that's a CCRI question. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> all right, thank you. You're welcome. <clears throat> Council Member Watson Curry. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Josh, quick question on the um, the second item, the home rehabilitation loans. I was just curious if we had um, data on 2018, how many applicants we had and how many um, loans were distributed. Uh, applicants, I'm not entirely sure of the number. Um, I know we had 11 uh, loans that we saw. 11 loans completed so far, one in process still. So a total of 12. Um, and no, I don't, I don't know the number uh, total. <laughs> I can tell you right now on our wait list, we've got uh, 18 individuals. 18 or eight? 18. 18, okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Council Member Gertz. Uh, kind of a follow up to that item uh, from last year's budget. How, uh, how much of the home rehabilitation loan program was utilized last year? The reason for my question is, do we end up, the processing takes so long that people don't end up utilizing the funds I, I believe they get utilized fully um, okay. this year again we still have one in process uh, but once that's completed it will have used the 2018 funds fully I believe okay thank you you're welcome council member Hendrickson uh, thank you mr. mayor under the ex accessibility improvements I noticed it's <clears throat> 2200 and to me that build one ramp I mean is that utilized How much was it utilized last year it seems like it's there's a little funding there especially if, if you're going to build a ramp or yeah uh, or so <clears throat> go ahead so for 2018 uh, one ramp was constructed uh, and that did not use the full budget uh, those are constructed uh, the CDBG funds uh, up until now have provided um, funds to buy the materials and then volunteers with the Home Builders Association have constructed the ramp uh, which is why we're able to do a couple a year with with that amount okay um, this year to increase utilization we're proposing to also have uh, available for construction as well as the purchase of okay thank you very much any other questions comments Thank you very much. Are there any citizens that wish to be heard on this matter? Hearing none, uh, is there a motion to close the public hearing? Second. A motion uh, moved by Council Member Hendrickson, seconded by uh, Council Member Carlson. Um, Paulson. <laughs> Paulson. <laughs> Follow. <laughs> uh, to approve the motion, uh, can everyone signify by saying aye. 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 Motion to oppose, same sign. Motion carries. <clears throat> and I believe next will be. Do we approve? My apologies. Do we approve the minutes? We did, Mr. Mayor, but we need to go back to number seven, citizens addressing the council next. Yes, okay. To see if there's any. Make sure, okay. Thank uh, you. Are there any citizens that wish to address the council at this time? Okay. Then moving on to number eight. On consent. Number 10, okay. It's done. That's what I asked to ask me. Number 10. Resolution to approve appointment of mayor to city council committees, boards, and commissions. So, Mr. Mayor, I pulled this together um, based on the charter section, as you can see, section 2.07, which states that the mayor's appointment to council committees must be by unanimous vote. However, our city attorney has um, some clarification that we need. This is the first time we've kind of done it this way. So um, I'll let my, our city attorney. Uh, thank you, Chris. Uh, Mayor, members of the city council. Uh, there was, I think, some confusion at our uh, staff level uh, as we were drafting uh, the 
policy regarding per diem uh, compensation for a council, uh, city council meetings uh, and subcommittees. And uh, under the charter, if the city council creates a committee that advises the board, the city council, like the advisory work group, that requires unanimous approval by the city council because if the mayor is serving on that. So if the mayor were to serve on the advisory budget group, that requires a unanimous vote. If it's an external board like the Diversion Authority or Metro Flood uh, Diversion Authority or the uh, Land Management Committee, then it's by majority vote only because the, the charter distinguishes between what are truly council committees to advise the council on city business and then you have external types of committees. And so there's a distinction. Uh, I haven't had a chance to look at whether the Board of Appeals is created by statute, but clearly the first one requires unanimous approval and the others would just require uh, uh, majority approval. So. Councilman Bergertz. So uh, is it unanimous present or unanimous of the council? Because we've, we're missing one council member. It's unanimous of the council, and since you have a council member that has not taken the oath of office, that position is not counted. So there's seven council members right now, so it would take seven. Oh, I, I thought she was sworn at 3.30. Wow. Oh. Um, and then my other question is, the Board of Appeals and Equalization and Metro Flood Diversion Authority aren't, doesn't the mayor serve on those as default anyway? Um, I did not have a chance to look at the Board of Equalization, but you are correct on the uh, Flood Diversion Authority. By agreement, the mayor has an automatic seat on the Diversion Authority. Okay. Uh, because I, I, I thought that the mayor always chairs the Board of Equalization. We have not looked that up yet. Yeah. I, I, I don't know offhand. I'd, I'd have to go back and look, look okay. that up. Thank you. Councilmember Durand. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Mayor. There wouldn't be an issue if we, if we voted and no. all voted yes, and we didn't need to vote yes, right? No, I think it's just clarification for future. <clears throat> all right, thank you. <coughs> Councilmember Gertz. Just a, maybe a clarification from you, uh, Mayor. Uh, obviously, you, you're going to have a busy year. You're comfortable attending the meetings and covering that. My understanding. And correct me if I'm wrong, those that might know uh, have more experience in this, but my understanding is this committee meets twice a year. Equalization. Equalization. What? And appeals. Once a year. Is it once a year? Yep. Then I would assume with advance notice I should be able to make that. But uh, like the uh, Red River Basin Commission and, you know, the other ones that are listed here, you're comfortable taking on that workload? Yes. Okay. Then I would move approval. So move to the second. Uh, motion made. Which Shelley? <laughs> okay. <laughs> motion made by Council Member Duran, seconded by Council Member Shelley Carlson. <laughs> uh, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Of reports number 12 on economic development activities. All right. New mayor, new council look up here. It's a good day for Moorhead. So happy to be here and uh, working with uh, city manager Volkers. We've, um, we'll be including a monthly economic development report that you'll see uh, at your city council uh, meetings. This will be coming after we present it monthly to the Economic Development Authority meetings. Uh, so this uh, this month was a little bit unique in that you'll just see a lot of just monthly highlights, and then we summarized uh, an annual report for my employer, Downtown Moorhead Inc., uh, to really kind of get into what we've accomplished in uh, in not even a year. Uh, it started in March. So happy to uh, to be here and happy to be working with all of you. And congratulations to those that are newly elected. Just some of the, the monthly highlights for the economic development report. 
We have uh, the 4th Street lot. You are, you are all aware of uh, the city has officially noticed this 4th Street lot, which is just directly west of the, the U.S. Bank building. It's a surface parking lot. Uh, that notice officially closes on January 16th, so just a couple days from now. Uh, we've had a, a couple inquiries, but mainly just kind of general information. Uh, and we will be having one uh, development firm that will be submitting a full-on proposal before uh, that notice closes. Uh, we'll have more to come with that and next steps as we move forward and in, into uh, the coming month. Uh, we've also had a, a great opportunity to, to work with West Central Initiative and, and other um, kind of close partners, but West Central Initiative is a, a group that does a lot of uh, gap financing for, for businesses. Uh, within the region. Uh, we also uh, kind of uncovered that, you know, Moorhead has a loan fund, which has about $900,000 of, of Moorhead's money. There's no state aid uh, or state uh, initiated money in that. Uh, we're working closely with those partners at West Central Initiative to kind of uh, really utilize that fund effectively. It hasn't really been used that much in the past, so we're eager to, uh, to start kind of fresh with a new partnership or with, with the West Central Initiative and, and utilize that uh, loan fund to its best ability. Uh, we've also uh, been made aware that they do meet quarterly as a, as a group. Uh, there's a, a regional um, economic development group that meets at West Central Initiative's offices in Fergus Falls. We also have the regional representatives from our state department, the uh, Department of Employment and Economic Development. Um, Moorhead really hasn't had a, a, a present at, presence at those meetings in the past. Uh, happy to report that you will be seeing myself and uh, uh, either myself, Amy Thorpe, uh, or someone from the economic uh, development team in attendance at those meetings. Um, exciting to announce that uh, Folkways, which is a community kind of based organization, uh, is, is bringing their, their kind of Red River Market, the indoor far, or, or, um, food market, to the Moorhead side of the river in February and March. Those are the beginning of February and the beginning of March. Uh, they're going to uh, utilize the Yumcomp Center, and bringing up to almost uh, 5,000, if not more, people into our community. So really excited to be partnering with Folkways uh, and, and doing a lot of things for our community in Moorhead. Excited to, to kick off in 2019 um, what's called the Business Retention and Expansion Program. I, I mentioned this to, I think, all of you at one point in time, but uh, really for us to do effective economic development work for this community, we need to get the pulse of our business community, the development community, uh, and, and just our residents as a whole. So this is going to be a, a consistent effort to really have a strong public outreach. We're going to the businesses. We're going to the developers. Uh, figuring out what our challenges are, figuring out what our strengths are, uh, and really tailoring our work plan to make sure that uh, we are working for those businesses. We're working for the people of Moorhead, not just us coming up with strategies that aren't aren't effective and aren't utilized to its full potential. Uh, you know, Jonathan uh, Judd, Mayor Judd, uh, you did a great job at uh, the Chamber event, the State of the Cities. This next kind of point on here is talking about the Far Fargo-Moorhead Science Center and Performing Arts Center. I think it's no secret, I've said it from the start, I think we, we wouldn't be doing justice to the people of Moorhead if we at least didn't explore uh, the possibility of having it in Moorhead. doesn't mean we have to, to have it or, fund, or figure out how we fund it or figure out where exactly it is, but I think the conversation needs to start. Uh, I think uh, you know we're we're at a point where we have to find a, a community champion that can lead this effort that can that can go um, uh, kind of explore what would be available from the state level. I'm excited to connect with uh, members at uh, Concordia and MSUM that could maybe be that community champion. Uh, each month we have in here just community uh, council or city council action uh, items and upcoming ones, so um, you're well aware of of those. Uh, thank you for all those that attended the community city-owned uh, properties meeting. I think that was a fantastic event that we had a few weeks back. Uh, Amy Thorpe and myself will be attending the Economic Development Association of Minnesota, which is abbreviated as EDEM, uh, their winter conference. This is a, another great opportunity where I think in the past, um, you know, we've, we've had a presence from Moorhead, but it maybe hasn't been as visible. So we're excited to, to, to be at these conferences. Uh, to work with our state partners, to work with our, our peers across the region and the state, uh, to really find out what some best practices are. We're all facing very similar similar issues. 
um, and figuring out what some challenges and some some new ideas are out there and really kind of bring it back to to be effective for Moorhead. Uh, thankful for for City Manager Chris Volkers and the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, we were able to attend, attend the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce event in St. Paul last week. Uh, this was right before the State of the Cities event. It was a, it was a long day, but uh, I know our, our, um, our representative, Paul Markwart, and our Senator Kent Eakin uh, were very glad for, for some more had attendance at that event that had over 1,500 people attending. Uh, so very excited to, to, to be there and, and to show our support, and, and what a wonderful opportunity with uh, Representative Paul Morcourt being the, the chair of the Taxation Committee at the state level this year. I think that's a tremendous opportunity and the, the folks from Flaherty and Hood kind of uh, mentioned the, the opportunity to capitalize on our permanency for the uh, Border Cities funding. So I'm really eager to, to touch base on that. You all uh, should have received a, a copy of Downtown Moorhead Inc.'s um, first annual newsletter. Again, I started in, in March, so it hasn't been a full year, but it's been a great year. And, and thankful to uh, city management, city leadership, the, the council, uh, the former mayor. And I'm, again, looking forward to working with each and every one of you because I do feel that this year, 2019, is a pivotal year for, for Moorhead, not just downtown Moorhead, but all of Moorhead. And, and we have the opportunity to really kind of put ourselves on the map and move forward with a lot of great stuff. So I'm um, excited for, for the happenings to come. and, and uh, and we're not going to slow down. We're going to keep moving. So happy to answer any questions. And, and again, congratulations to those that are newly elected. Any questions for Mr. LaPointe? Council Member Gertz. Uh, maybe not so much a question, but uh, one of the, you know, thank you for the report. I mean, I, I think by reporting to the council, the mayor and council on a monthly basis, not only informs the council, but also has an opportunity for the public to hear what's going on because there's a lot of people that uh, watch the, uh, the broadcast. Uh, the one thing I want to point out is, that I'm really excited about is the business retention and expansion uh, program. I served on the Economic Development Authority for <clears throat> five years and uh, pushed real hard to get the executive director for the EDA and this was one of the reasons why because we have over 800 businesses in Moorhead, and I just felt that that's really the heart and soul of, of our business. Um, uh, Moorhead citizens are, are very committed to um, um, doing business with Moorhead businesses, and um, it's just good to have somebody going out there and visiting with them because that's really where we're going to see our growth. We can chase big uh, big developments and big uh, businesses that come here, but uh, I think our, you know, our um, success rate is going to be much higher to keep our existing businesses and grow those businesses. Uh, we've seen it through Regals and we've seen it uh, at um, Pactive and um, a number of you know major businesses that have expanded here in our community and. Uh, just to have that communication so that they know that if they have an issue. They have an advocate working uh, with them to uh, make sure that they don't decide, hey, I don't feel like I'm getting any attention here, so I'm just going to jump across the river. So I, to me, I think that's probably the, the jewel that, uh, that we can um, polish here in our community is, is our existing businesses. And so I'm really excited to see that that, that program will be an active program. Uh, and just a final thing to say about that is we're all – we're all ambassadors for the city of Moorhead. And uh, if there's an opportunity that you can use any of our, the council members to help advocate on, uh, on the Moorhead's behalf, I, I would hope that you would uh, reach out to, to us. I, I'm presuming I speak for the uh, council when I say that. Um, because what's, uh, what's good for Moorhead is uh, helps our community. So I appreciate the work that you're doing. Yes, thank you, uh, Councilmember Gertz, and, and couldn't uh, agree more. We have uh, the ability to kind of use our economic development authority as community ambassadors as well, our, our city council and, and the mayor. Uh, a lot of times uh, we'll, we'll have the ability to bring somebody along and, and have that, that attendance as well. I think it means a lot to have um, especially elected officials uh, along and, and really show their commitment. And 
Uh, you're right. It's it's a it's a small thing of just going out and talking to these folks, but uh, you would be surprised uh, how little interaction some of these folks have had with the city. Um, and I think I think that just become, become became a you know just a trend for a lot of different cities. But if you if you spend a little bit of time, I think it goes a long ways to to making sure that these businesses are successful. And and we certainly want them all to stay in this community too. Council Member Shelley Carlson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Derek, could you talk a little bit about, um, in our packet it says that you've been working with the Greater Fargo Moorhead Economic Development Corporation on the software? Yeah, absolutely. So um, so we all know they have a, a new leadership over there with Joe Riso, and, and Joe comes from a background of doing a lot of different um, work in economic development from running a, a regional economic development corporation to, to running chambers and downtown organizations. He also was um, a part of an organization that developed software specific to uh, this business retention expansion uh, program. He is looking at bringing some uniformity to the region as far as when we're going out to primary sector in their realm, primary sector entrepreneurialism um, kind of industries, they want a, a cohesive um, software platform that all this data can be housed in. Now that doesn't mean that we can see what West Fargo is doing or, or what um, Fargo is doing in specific <clears throat> terms, but that means if Joe and his team from the Greater Fargo Moorhead EDC are out talking to a Moorhead business, uh, they're able to input that information and we're able to share that or see that information for our knowledge and for our uh, purposes of trying to keep that business around or <coughs> to have an understanding that maybe they're struggling with this type of uh, problem or they're looking to expand. Uh, we have a direct access point to that information. Vice versa, if now myself or anybody from City Hall goes out and meets with somebody, we could put that input uh, into that software and they would be able to see it as well. I think it's, um, it's a great idea. You know, we didn't touch on it. A lot of it is just conversing with the businesses and, and figuring out what their needs are. But I think there has to be um, strategy upon, upon specific data that we want to um, get from these companies, whether that's how many employees they have, um, you know, other kind of points that we can we can strategize with um, that we're always up to, to date with our business community. Um, and this software helps with that. I should clarify too, so even though Joe Reso with the EEC has helped develop some software programs, the software they're exploring is not associated or affiliated with what he had created in the past. So this would be a, a separate platform, uh, nothing for his personal gain. Any other questions or comments for Mr. LaPointe? Thank you again for all of your hard work. We really appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. I believe we move down to number 25 on the agenda, uh, which is a resolution to approve award of contract for bulk fuel. Yeah, good evening. I'm Paul Feekner, the facilities and fleet manager for the city of Moorhead. Um, I just wanted to give everyone a quick update on where we were last we talked in December. Um, about contracted fuel and what we do is we operate a fueling facility at the Public Works facility for city equipment and vehicles. In 2018 we saw a rise in price for the fuel purchases and we're looking into new processes to purchase that fuel um, to hopefully generate the lowest, lowest overall operating cost for the city. Uh, we did issue an RFP for contracted fuel in December and the decision was made to decline the bids at that time. And the reason being is they were higher than we anticipated. And in the, <clears throat> excuse me, in the recent months with the sharp decline in fuel prices, uh, hoping to play the market, if you will, and receive a lower price there. So just kind of an update on where we are in that process. Uh, what we are doing starting January 1 is still monitoring what that bid came in at and what we are actually paying. So we can still compare the two processes and see uh, what will be the better uh, venue in the end. What, re what I'm requesting now is approval to award contract for the third and fourth quarter of 2019. We currently have a RFP out for that to receive bids and um, 
are looking to award contracts if we see the price favorable um, to do that process. And that is set up to, we would award it to the lowest, lowest uh, bid, overall cost. Also, another uh, process we discussed is conversations with the city of Fargo and joining them in this process. This is the um, request for proposal and the contracted fuel is the process that Fargo uses for all of their fuel. And they have for quite some time. Uh, we're continuing conversations with them so that in hopefully in 2020 we can join a contract with them. The method, methodology there is that we would have a higher volume of fuel and hopefully lower the unit cost for the purchasing that fuel. So again here the overall goal is to provide the lowest cost fuel for the city and we're looking into several options to, to do that. Councilmember Gertz. So, um, you know, I appreciate the update, and but we're really not voting on any purchases tonight because that comes out of your general budget. In previous years, we we didn't. I mean, if it was in the budget, it was in the budget. I can understand if we had contracted out a number of, you know, purchases for a large volume. But am I missing something there? Um. Mr. Mayor, Councilmember Gertz, I believe it's on the agenda because um, the state law requires we go out for bid for anything over 175000 a year, and then the council would approve that purchase. So we are asking for your approval ahead of time to award the bid, and that was my question about the timing. You're asking for the council to approve award of the bid, but the bids are, bids are not in yet, correct? Correct. So you're asking for the authority? Yes. Why wouldn't we wait to award a bid until we have the bid? So, Councilmember Gertz, here, the, 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 in this situation, when the bidders bid, they have give us a 30-minute time frame after the close of the bid to award the bid <laughs> because it's that tight with the fuel prices going up and down. So, therefore, we have to ask for your approval ahead of time to award the bid to the lowest responsible bidder. Sounds like the steel industry. <laughs> <laughs> Is yeah. that correct, Paul? Yes, that's correct. Thank you. Council Member Duran. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And <clears throat> we're assured that the same policy or the same procedure would follow. If the bids come in higher than the price last year, you would reject and then start over again? or Yeah, when, that... when the bids come in, we'll evaluate them and uh, make the decision if we want to award it or not. Um, if they're unfavorable to a large degree, we would decline them again. Okay, thank you. Any other uh, questions or comments for Mr. Fickner? Did I pronounce your name right, sir? Yeah, Fickner. Fickner? Yep. Okay, great. Thank you. Is there a motion on the table to consider? The motion to Is there a second? Uh, motion made by Council Mem Member Watson Curry, seconded by uh, Council Member Shelley Dahlquist. Um, all in favor, please approve by. Oh, question. Okay. I'm, I'm sorry. Question on the motion by Council Member Gertz. Sorry. So, um, being that we don't have the, the actual. Um, vendor to award, you, would it be prudent, maybe this is a question for you, John, to award authorization or approve the authorization to make award upon receipt of an acceptable bid? Yeah, a great question, uh, Council Member Gertz. So in these situations, typically you would authorize uh, city staff to accept the lowest responsible bid and then have the city staff fill out a certification once the bid's accepted and return that back to the council. So perhaps it, it could be a friendly amendment. Is there a friendly amendment to to the current motion? Okay. And the current amendment is to amendment is to almost responsible bidder. Uh, the authority uh, authorize city staff to award the bid the bid to the lowest responsible bidder. Is there, <laughs> is there a second needed on that? 
I believe. Was a second. Yeah. Sure that you... Oh, you agree? I, yes. Okay. So the motion to amend with the language stated by Mr. Shockley has been motioned by uh, Council Member Watson Curry and seconded by Council Member Shelley Dahlquist. Is there any other further discussion needed on that friendly amendment? All approve, uh, please signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Fickner. Thank you. And I believe we are down to mayor and council reports. And I'm not sure. Oh, thank you, Councilmember Watson Curry. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, it's been a while, it seems. Uh, well, one thing that I wanted to highlight, it's been published on the city website, uh, but the pedestrian bridge between uh, Memorial Park and Oak Grove is open. Um, that uh, construction took a, took a while. <laughs> um, so I know we've had a lot of folks uh, close by to that park wondering when it is indeed open. And it is open across it myself this weekend and um, opens up some different op options for people commuting or doing some recreation along the river. Uh, January 9th, I attended the um, uh, Cass Clay Food Partners Commission meeting. And uh, I wanted to draw attention, um, oh, Chris has stepped out, but uh, we had a presentation by Melissa Soblick from the um, Great Plains Food Bank. Um, they had conducted a um, statewide study and also including um, Clay County as well as that's part of their service. Uh, I did forward the, um, the full uh, report, which is about 100 pages, but there is also um, a highlighted um, or an, uh, uh, abbreviated version of it. There's additionally a one-page um, snapshot on hunger in Cass and Clay County. Um, so I, I would request that um, our city manager um, share that with city council and city staff as, as um, she seems appropriate. But one thing I just wanted to highlight, well, a couple things. Um, they highlighted the demographics and it was really interesting because the face of hunger um, looks different than you might imagine. 64% um, of them are in permanent housing, 68% uh, of them are, are white, um, and it's a very educated group as well, 85% of them have completed high school. So that's pretty concerning. Um, the other uh, thing that Melissa made um, a point of talking about is they really want to work upstream um, and not just giving people a basket of food, but really helping them address the root causes of uh, their hunger issues. So. Um, that's looking to help from us, whether it's through affordable housing, um, transportation, um, or health access. So the last thing I wanted to highlight is the tough choices that families are making. Um, I thought this really was an um, interesting number. Households are choosing between food and sometimes housing payments, so that's 41% of them. Utility payments, gas for cars, medicine or transportation. So all those things were 30% or more of Cass and Clay users. So I will be sharing that report. And so Chris, I would ask if you could share that as appropriate. Um, and I believe that is all I have for my report. Thank you for sharing that, Councilmember Lawson Curry. Any other reports uh, on behalf of council members? I'll just do, uh, Mr. Mayor, I'll just do a really quick uh, report on the Moorhead Library. I attended the first meeting, or my first meeting for them, um, and they are looking to possibly do some type of event in February that um, I'll be forwarding information to Chris to disseminate out, um, so you guys would all be invited. Also, um, they have two notaries on their staff now that can provide service to individuals um, if they need that type of service. Thank you for that report, uh, Council Member Carlson. Uh, any other reports? I'll just briefly state that uh, I had the uh, uh, pleasure and honor of uh, speaking at the uh, State of the Cities address uh, on behalf of the uh, Fargo Moorhead uh, Chamber of Commerce. Uh, uh, again, I think we're in a great position right now. Uh, I think the city's looking great thanks to the work 
of city uh, manager Chris Volkers and uh, city staff. Uh, greatly appreciate the hard work and effort that everyone has put forth. Uh, hopefully the uh, citizens will know that we do have a very uh, competent, uh, very educated, very well-informed city staff that is working hard and even into the midnight hours, apparently, as they're answering emails at midnight, one o'clock in the morning, trying to make our city <laughs> better. Uh, so uh, again, thank you uh, for your work and all that you've done. And uh, I guess that's all I have for my brief report. Anyone else uh, have any items or reports to make? All right. Seeing none. Then we'll move on to a uh, summary of the city manager's 2018 performance report. Uh, and so regarding the uh, summary of the perf performance evaluation of the city manager, Chris Volkers, uh, the city council uh, of the, the city of Moorhead did meet on December 10th, 2018 in executive session uh, to conduct a regular performance review of our city manager, Chris Volkers, for the period commencing January 1st, 2018 through December 10th, 2018. Uh, during her annual performance evaluation, uh, the Moorhead City Council evaluated Ms. Volkers in the following specific areas. Uh, one, elected body relationships. Two, organizational. Three, community relations. Four, fiscal performance. Uh, five, intergovernmental agency association relationships. Number six, communication. Seven, personal. And number eight, goals and target achievement. The City Council has determined that Ms. Volker's performance in each of the above described areas range from exceeds expectations to exceptional. Uh, the City Council did review Ms. Volker's overall performance as City Manager and determined that she was exceeding expectations for the position of City Manager. Ms. Volker's did provided, or sorry, then provided input and feedback regarding her position and discussed goals and targets for achievement for the upcoming year. Thank you again for your hard work and your effort, Ms. Fulkers. Thank you. Appreciate Thank it. you to the City Council for the support. Thank you. Then we'll move on to number 32, City Manager Reports Updates. Thank you, Madam Mayor, City Council. I'd like to give two updates tonight. First, I'd like to introduce our new finance director, Carla McCall. Is Carla, sorry to do this to you. Can you come up for a second? <laughs> I'd like to introduce you. Um, Carla started, let's see, right before Christmas. So she's been here about a month, almost a month, not quite, almost. Um, she has significant city finance experience, so we were very fortunate to find Carla. Um, could you tell them a little bit about your background, Carla? I have served as a finance director for municipal government in multiple states across the country. I've been in Montana, most recently North Carolina, but always seem to come back to Minnesota. So I was in Purim, Minnesota for 15 years, uh, then went to North Carolina for three years when my son was in the military there. And then he came back and all my children still, grown children are here in Minnesota. So we decided it was time to come back when they started having little ones that we wanted to see. <laughs> uh, so I was in Faribault most recently for four and a half years. And then uh, when I saw Moorhead's opening, it was an excellent um, location centralized to my children and grandchildren. So I was excited to come up and, and be able to um, extend my help and do what I can for the city of Moorhead. Carla has been doing a great job in providing some insight and maybe different ways of looking at things. So it's always good when you have somebody with that experience and she can come in with fresh eyes. So I know Dan Molly has been excited about it and a lot of the staff, of course, have been excited to have you. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Glad welcome. to be here. Thank you, Carla. My second report is um, we do have our new lead prosecutor in the audience, Cheryl Dyson. And if you have any questions, she's glad to come up and answer them. I'm going to give you kind of an overall summary about what is going on with the city prosecutor office. Um, so if we rewind, um, in November, we were given the, the notice that or, um, excuse me, February 1st, we would have to take over all city prosecution. That um, was notice was given to all five cities, Moorhead, Dilworth, Howley, um, Glendon, and Barnesville. Um, we've been meeting with the other cities in while we planned for this. We didn't think we could do this. You know this, and, and we asked for an extension because we didn't think we could do it. 
in two and a half months. And so, long behold, we ended up hiring Cheryl Dyson right away from the um, Clay County Prosecutor's County Attorney's Office. And um, she came over, and then we started advertising um, for the other four positions, or three and a half positions. So. Um, I'll give you a little history about that, but first I want to say a big, huge kudos to our HR department. We have never done such speed hiring in our life, <laughs> and I don't know that we could ever replicate what we did again, but Jill Wanger is here from, um, as our HR director, and she led the effort, and John Chockley was extremely, extremely instrumental in this. And so we are up to speed, up, uh, we are staffed up. We have all five staff on board starting before February 1st, which is amazing. Uh, we are fortunate to get all five staff with the county attorney experience. So um, they can, they'll walk right in and on February 1st, they'll be able to just go to court and handle the caseload. We hired, um, at last time, I think I mentioned to you, we were gonna have two prosecutors and two clerical which is exactly what we were paying for from at the county attorney's office for all five cities to do this prosecution. When we were um, told that we couldn't have an office or be located over in our vacant space and our workstations and offices that are vacant in the Clay County um, um, Law Enforcement Center, in the, our own police department, we had to find space. The only space we had um, was in City Hall here. So what we ended up doing is bumping our IT staff, who um, our IT director was great and he offered to be bumped. They had just moved there six months ago and we had just remodeled their space six months ago for them. He, we had to relocate them and then we took the set, um, space on second floor where IT is currently. We had to remodel both. There's additional expenses with that. Um, and then we had to hire a third prosecutor. There was no way we could get back and forth this far and meet with clients and handle that caseload with two attorneys covering all those courtrooms and being off the campus of the courthouse. So we had to hire another attorney, so there's another significant cost associated. I do not have numbers for you yet. We're still trying to figure out everything. Um, but we have hired three attorneys, all from the Clay County Attorney's Office. Um, they applied, interviewed, and were hired. So three total, Cheryl being the lead. And then we have a paralegal who recently worked there. And she will be here full time. And then we, no, she will be here 24 hours. 25 hours a week, sorry about that, 25 hours a week, without benefits, which is helpful for our cost. And then we do have a full-time um, legal assistant who did apply also from the Clay County Attorney's Office. She actually has um, a, a victim witness um, experience. She handles it over there. We are so fortunate that we have that experience that, again, we're going to be able to hit the ground running. We won't need to recreate anything. In fact, um, John's office has been um, very helpful in helping us set up the office to do more, to be more efficient in how we process the cases. The um, Cheryl Dyson also would like to go paperless in our city attorney's office, or our city prosecutor's office, which would be huge for us. We reallocated like a copier, a secondhand copier down there. We've got a couple chairs for people to sit, reallocated, but we did have to buy the workstation so people can sit there. And then, as I said, relocate and um, remodel space for IT. So. Those are kind of what's going on. Um, we've hired or we've applied for application and access to the BCA and all the online systems that we need in order for the city prosecutor's office to do their job. Um, uh, we, um, the, the court's been great, by the way, so they have invited Cheryl over to meet with their um, monthly, I think, judges meeting where the prosecutors and the defense attorneys, public defenders are meeting and um, to talk about the caseloads and so forth. They've already invited her over to participate in it. That was very, very helpful. The court's been great about that and very inclusive. And in fact, the county attorney staff has been great um, helping in, in most areas. So that's been the victim witness area specifically has been just great. Um, the other thing, um, we're meeting with the five cities, we being one of the five cities, they've all expressed their interest. They'd like to know how much this is going to cost them. Of course, they want to know that before they go to their city councils and get approval to contract with us for this service. Um, irregardless of their participation, we would have to set this up anyway. So I am going to be asking the city council for authority to, um, for Moorhead to pay the upfront cost because we would have to do it anyway. So it would be seem only fair. Their budgets are set 
if we need to do it, there will be an amount to be transferred from reserves that I'm going to be requesting to set up the offices with the workspace and the accesses and so forth. That shouldn't be, you know, huge, but it will be something that I'm going to ask that um, more have absor or absorb. With that, there will be a task force, or what are we? What are you calling it? An advisory board? Advisory board. Yeah, with the five cities, so they can communicate back and forth with our prosecutor, and they are very thrilled about that. They haven't had as much communication as they um, would prefer when they're in processing their cases that they write the citations on and the long form on, and they want to know if the um, city attorney or city prosecutor doesn't prosecute. Why, for example, if they decline prosecution or they settle for a lesser charge, they want that information and that communication hasn't been going back and forth. So we've got this advisory board, one from each city, will sit on it and work with our city um, prosecutor and kind of advise them how we do business. So this really is a true partnership with our cities and everybody's pretty excited about that, I think. So that's my part of the report. John, do you have anything you want to add? No, I think you covered that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Any uh, questions or comments uh, from Ms. Volkers regarding her report? City Prosecution Services, Council Member Gertz. Um, so one of the um, reasons that uh, the county stated that the price that they charge us went up so much is because of the workload. And does, uh, I, I, don't know, I, I don't know if I should address this to Cheryl, but I'll address it to you. Um, does uh, the team that you've hired have concern about the workload? Um, I, I won't, I'd ask Cheryl to come up and address it. What she, what's been relayed to me is that with the two attorneys, they weren't sure they could do it with the two attorneys. We were going to start with the two attorneys because we thought we'd be on campus and we could do that. Um, if you recall, I offered for the third attorney to the county. So we're still at the level, right, that the count we that we um, offered, the county was requesting in year one. So we're at three attorneys and one and a half clerical staff. I'll let Cheryl address specifically if they think they can handle that workload. I'm pretty sure they, she said they can, but I'll let her address that. Mr. Mayor, council members, uh, Cheryl Dyson. You know, honestly, to answer that question, I have a very good feeling about it, but at this stage, uh, it is it is a, uh, gut feeling based on my work uh, almost 14 years in the Clay County Attorney's Office. Um, the cases that we are work going to be working on solely here in the City Prosecutor's Office were interwoven in all of the Clay County Attorney's, um, what will now be the Clay County Attorney's cases. So it's, um, I don't really know how to tease out those numbers. I would imagine that there's probably something that Clay County administ or Court Administration could do. But of course, we have been working so hard and so fast to get all of the, the office and the hiring and um, you know IT and all that stuff on board that uh, that is not something that I have specifically looked up, even if it is accessible. So again, I'm just going to go back to telling you that I, I believe that three prosecutors will do a very good job at this, uh, one of the things that I really want to do is not short shrift the cities in the services that they are getting the law enforcement because um, I know that they were frustrated uh, for many years, and uh, and I can attest to the fact the county attorney's office is a very busy place. And so uh, there were decisions made to focus on the big crimes uh, and the little ones often went by the wayside. And of course, the little ones have victims too. And so, and interest as far as the community is concerned, safety and, and that kind of thing. So uh, I just am very excited to have this opportunity to focus on those crimes and give law enforcement the tools they need through prosecution um, and supporting you know, their endeavors to make the community safer. Um, so yes, long answer, but I do think we're gonna be able to make it quite fine with three. And I just told um, Chris that I would be checking in with her and letting her know how things are going. Well, obviously, the, the staff that came from the county to come to uh, be on the city's team must not be concerned about it. Otherwise, they wouldn't have uh, they wouldn't have made the jump from the county to the city. So I'm presuming they must feel comfortable with the workload that they're going to be expecting. Yeah, they do. I I, I mean, just anecdotally, um, people were very concerned when it was going to be a two attorney operation. Um, the, th the three of us. Uh, all of us are just very excited. The paralegal's excited. The legal assistant is excited. I mean, this is going to be, honestly, 
something here I'm going to get up in the morning and look forward to going to work every day. It's going to be exciting um, to develop this department from the ground up. It's already been great for me, and I'm, I know they're looking forward to coming and joining the city. Well, I appreciate you um, uh, coming on board, and Chris, thank you for, uh, and John, thank you for the effort that you uh, put forth to solve this situation. It was uh, unfortunate that uh, we had uh, worked so quickly, but I appreciate the effort, and I'm sure the council will uh, feels the same way, and um, look forward to having a successful prosecution attorney's office uh, for the city. Thank you. Are there any uh, questions for Ms. Dyson? And I can piggyback briefly um, with Council Member uh, Gertz. And I do appreciate uh, Ms. Volkers and Mr. Shockley uh, for uh, bringing us uh, up to speed and also uh, making sure we're not missing a beat. Having worked <clears throat> in that position in the county attorney's office, I can attest that, yes, you will probably need three attorneys to do that. There's four courtrooms for the public to know uh, in the courthouse that all operate at the same time. And unless you're <laughs> going to clone someone, uh, you're not going to be able to have, and there's still one, we're, we're still one courtroom down. And uh, those cases are scattered out amongst uh, four different judges, three different judges, so coverage is a big issue. And in order to be efficient and be effective, you have to invest uh, in, a, in a strong prosecution office. So thank you, Ms. Dyson, for stepping up to the plate and uh, winning the service. We really, oh, really appreciate it. Totally my pleasure. Thank you. Are there any uh, other questions or comments regarding that matter? Then uh, moving on to number 33, uh, executive session. Uh, the council will now enter with a motion. Uh, executive session pursuant to Minnesota statute 13D.03 to discuss negotiations regarding adjustments to the city manager's employment agreement. Uh, motion moved by council member Gertz and seconded by council member Duran. Uh, all in favor, please signify your vote by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. We now move into executive session.
Okay, we have exited executive session. I'm assuming, since I'm still new to all this, do I need to make a motion to exit no. executive session? No, you just need a motion to adjourn. So Sounds good to me. A uh, motion to adjourn, <laughs> moved by Councilperson Carlson and seconded by Councilperson Watson Curry. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, same sign. Motion passes. Have a good evening. <laughs>